يتدبرون القرآن أفلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على النبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين So the title of the next talk is uh, The Sunnah Leads to Paradise and Innovations Lead to Hellfire It will be delivered by our uh, noble brother Abu Iyad Amjad Rafiq I'm sure that most of you brothers uh, don't need an introduction to uh, Amjad or Abu Khadija They effectively are the, uh, the backbone behind Maktaba Salafiya uh, the various websites, the various material, the translations, the gathering, um, and all of what you predominantly see on the internet by way of clarification of aqidah issues, manhaj issues, in general and in specific, uh, it is uh, 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 essentially uh, a large part of that is to do with our brother uh, Abu Iyad. Uh, I hope that all of you can benefit from uh, from this dars. Uh, take notes wherever you can, Jazakumullah khair, and you're willing to ask questions after as well. Barakallah fiqh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu, wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina, man yahdihillahu fala mudillalah, wa man yudlil fala hadiyalah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abuduhu wa rasooluh, amma ba'd, fa inna ahsan al-kalami kalamullah, وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. So the lecture in front of us today is Sunnah guides or leads to paradise and bid'ah guides or leads to the hellfire. So inshallah our intention in this lecture is to establish these two statements from the Quran and from the Sunnah and we're going to begin with the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surat uh, An-Nisa in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَمَنْ يُطِئِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ وَمَنْ يُطِئِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلِيهِمْ they, are, they will be with those upon whom Allah has bestowed His favor. So whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger, they will be with those upon whom Allah has bestowed His favor. And then he continues and he says, مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين from the prophets and from the siddiqeen those who are truthful who are truthful in their speech in their belief in their deed in everything والشهداء and the martyrs والصالحين and the righteous and then he continues and says وحسن أولئك رفيقا what a good or excellent companionship they are. And then in the next ayah, Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْفَضْلُ مِنَ اللَّهِ That is a bounty from Allah. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ عَلِيمَا And sufficient is Allah as an all-knower. So this is in Surah An-Nisa, verses 69 to 70. And we start with this verse, because in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a ni'mah, a favor and a bounty upon four categories of people. They are the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the righteous. And he explains that this is a bounty and a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this ni'mah, this favor which is mentioned, he mentioned ni'mah and fadl. In these two verses, in the first verse, ni'mah, an'am Allahu alihim, ni'mah. And the second, al-fadl. This favor and this bounty 
its explanation returns us back to Surah Al-Fatiha, the first chapter in the Quran which we recite at least 17 times a day. And in this chapter in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and that which we say, we repeat in our salah, اِحْذِنَ السِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ سِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned three groups. There are three groups or three categories which are mentioned in the second half of this surah. The first of those are the ones upon whom is Allah, Allah's favor. Who we know from the first ayah are the, Nabi, who are the, the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs and the righteous. So the connection between the two verses, they both explain each other. So the first are those upon whom is Allah's favor and bounty. And the second of those are the one upon whom is Allah's anger. And the third of those are those who are astray. These three classifications are on the basis of two things. Those two things are knowledge and action. Knowledge and action, and more specifically, Al-Ilm al nafi wal amal salih We have the beneficial knowledge, and then we have the righteous action. On the basis of these two things, we have three classifications of the people. So either a person is upon Al-Ilm al nafi wal amal salih which is sound beneficial knowledge and righteous action in which case he is alongside and with the path of those upon whom Allah has favored he's with the prophets the uh, truthful ones the martyrs and the righteous or he is someone who despite having the knowledge al ilm al nafi then he is someone who does not bring the amal salih al amal salih and this characteristic is something that is prominent and found amongst the Yahud. Or thirdly, he is someone who acts. He acts, but he does so not on the basis of knowledge, upon other than knowledge. So he acts before knowledge or upon other than knowledge. In this case, he is astray. He is misguided. And so this characteristic is something that is prominent amongst the Christians. It doesn't mean that, there, aren't, that there, are, there are not amongst the Christians upon whom is Allah's anger, and nor that there are not from the Jews who are astray, there are. But it means that these qualities are prominent. The Jews overwhelmingly, they know the truth and do not act upon it. And the Christians overwhelmingly, they act upon other than knowledge, and they are, they are misguided. Now, once we've established that it is al-ilm al-nafi' and al-amal al-salih these two things that determine the favor and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon those who are upon that path and who are upon the path to paradise then we see in another this now leads us to a third ayah in the Quran and this ayah in the Quran is in Surah Al-Fatih in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Huwa alladhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al haq liyudhirahu ala deen kullih wa kafa billahi shahida. What is the connection between what we mentioned in Surah Al Fatiha and between this ayah here, which this ayah occurs three times in the Quran? The connection is that the scholars of Islam, like Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, and likewise from the contemporary scholars like Sheikh Salih al fawzan they say that al-ilm al-nafi' the beneficial knowledge it is the same as al-huda it is the same as al-huda and al-amal al-salih the righteous action it is the same as deen al-haq which is mentioned in the second verse in the second verse Allah says he is the one who sent his messenger with guidance, bil huda, 
Bilhuda here meaning al ilmun nafi, the beneficial knowledge, which is the one of the two things being alluded to in Surah Al Fatiha. Wadin al Haq and the religion of truth. Wadin al Haq this means al Amal al Salih, the righteous deed, the righteous action, the righteous practice. Liyudhirahu ala dini kullih that he may make it overcome, overwhelm over all other religion. And sufficient is Allah as a witness. So from this third ayah now we understand that the dhuhur, that the that the this uh, overtaking and uh, overwhelming and manifesting of this religion, it is on the basis that it is al huda wa dini al haq, which is al ilm al nafi wal amal al salih, beneficial knowledge. And righteous action. This ayah for the ones who want the reference is Surah Al Fat 48, verse number 28. Sorry? Three categories? Yeah. So we said that, that Al Ilmun Nafi, so we said from Surah Al Fatiha, Allah divided all the people into three groups on the basis of knowledge and action. Beneficial knowledge, and righteous action. There's only three groups. Those who combine beneficial knowledge and righteous action, they are the ones upon whom is Allah's favor. And they are the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the righteous. And then those who do not act upon the knowledge, and then those who do not, who act but upon other than knowledge. Right? So the connection between what's in Surah Al Fatiha and the verse in Surah uh, Al Fatih. Is that al ilm al nafi is al huda? Al ilm al nafi, beneficial knowledge, is al huda, is guidance. And al amal al salih, the righteous action, is din al haq, is the true and real religion. So the the point behind all of this, ya ikhwan, what is the point behind all of this? The point behind all of this is if we go back to the very first verse that we that we began with. وَمَنْ يُتِئِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ Whoever obeys Allah and obeys the Messenger. We see here all of the components and the elements which a person must bring in order for him to be certain that he is on the path to paradise. He's upon the way that leads to paradise. Which is obedience to Allah, ta'atu Allah, wa ta'atu nabi and obedience of the Prophet ﷺ, which from another angle is Al-Ilm Al-Nafi Wal Amal Al-Salih, which from another angle is Al-Huda Wa Deen Al-Haq upon that ayah, that we understand that all of this is what a person must be upon to be with the Prophets, to be with the truthful and the martyrs and the righteous, because we know that they are from the people of, of Paradise. So, when all of this becomes clear, then we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, the one who divided and the one who split the people in this way is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he's the one who informed us that there are those upon whom is his favor, his ni'mah, and in the other ayah his fadl. And in contrast he explained there are those who upon whom his, is his ghadab, his anger. And there are those who are misguided, those who are upon al-dalal. So this tafriq or this separation itself is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where we, are, where we are going with all of this, as we shall see inshallah ta'ala from the proofs in the Quran and the Sunnah, where we are leading to, is to make the point that it is not the people of truth. It is not the people of the Sunnah, the people of the Jama'ah. The people upon Salafiyyah who divide and who split the people. It is not us who split and divide the people. Rather it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his prior knowledge and from his qada wal qadar who is the one who has split and divided the people and explained as much from his prior knowledge. So he said that there are those upon whom is Allah's favor there are those who do not act upon the ilm, upon them is anger, and there are those who act upon other than ilm, 
and they are astray. So in this in the in this surah in the Quran, Allah has divided the people right from the very beginning, and He has warned. And essentially, when we call upon Allah, we make dua to Allah. We are asking Allah to protect us, not to fall into this way, nor to fall into that way. Now, from this point, when we move to other ayat in the Quran, so we see that Allah subhanahu wa taala is the one who has shown the different ways, has shown the way of guidance and the ways of misguidance. And the ways of misguidance are always based upon one of these two things, either acting upon other than knowledge or not acting upon the knowledge. All of misguidance falls into these two things, no matter which bid'a, which dalala we look at, whether it be from actual religions which oppose Islam, or whether it be actual doctrines or schools or methodologies which oppose the sunnah. All of them will have these ingredients. Acting upon other than knowledge or not acting upon the knowledge that you that you that you have been have been brought. So from these two broad ways we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the affair even more clear and more apparent in the Quran. Because in the Quran he has explained in numerous ayat, but we shall mention only two at this stage for the sake of brevity. And the first of those ayat is in Surah An Nahl. Surah 16, verse number 9. In this ayah, Allah says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ قَصْدُ السَّبِيلِ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ قَصْدُ السَّبِيلِ وَمِنْهَا جَائِرْ وَمِنْهَا جَائِرْ Which means that upon Allah, there are in fact a number of explanations of this ayah. One of the meanings is that upon Allah does the path lead to. To Allah does the path lead to, or upon Allah is it to explain the path. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ قَصْدُ السَّبِيلِ Then he said, وَمِنْهَا جَائِرْ وَمِنْهَا جَائِرْ Then from it is that which deviates or swerves. And in fact, Ali رضي الله عنه, he used to read this ayah as وَمِنْكُمْ جَائِرْ وَمِنْكُمْ جَائِرْ So there's a number of ways to read the ayah. وَمِنْهَا جَائِرْ or وَمِنْكُمْ جَائِرْ So this would mean that on this path there is that which swerves and deviates. Or it can mean that amongst you is one who deviates and swerves from this path. Then Allah says وَلَوْ شَاءَ لَحَدَاكُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ If Allah had so willed he would have guided all of you. He would have guided all of you. So now what we understand, we get a further clarification, we get a further explanation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with respect to this path, this straight path, that there is jair, that there is that which deviates and swerves from this path. And that if Allah had so willed, He would have guided the whole of mankind. Which means that the one who deviates and splits and swerves that this is from the qada and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this is for a wisdom, is for a wisdom as we shall see later in the talk inshallah ta'ala. But the point we are making as we go through this, that all of this, it is not the people of the sunnah who split the ummah, as they say and as they claim. Rather the people of the sunnah, we cling to the truth, we bite onto the truth, and we try to remove this splitting and differing, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed from his hikmah, from his wisdom, to see who is the Sunni and who is the, the Bid'i, who is the one who follows the path other than the path of the Sunnah. Now Imam al-Shatibi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he has a comment upon this ayah, and he says that when Allah says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ قَصْدُ السَّبِيلِ Upon Allah is the, or to Allah is the, the moderate middle path, he says, Al-Muqtasid, Al-Muqtasid, Bain al ghulu wa taqseer It is the moderate middle way in between exaggeration and extremism and between negligence. And then he says, Al-Jair huwa al-Ghali wa aw al That the one being referred to as Jair, the one who swerves in this ayah, it is either the extremist, the one who exaggerates, exaggerates or the one who is the one who falls short and is negligent. وَكِلَاهُمَا مِنْ أَوْسَافِ الْبِدَعِ 
And both of these are from the traits and qualities of bid'ah. So this is the first ayah we wanted to establish. And the second ayah that we wanted to establish is the famous ayah that you are all familiar with. It is from the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud who said, radiyallahu anhu, that the messenger of Allah وسلم, he drew a line in the sand and then he said, hadha sabilullah, then he drew lines to the right and to the left and then he said, these are the varying divergent paths at the end of everyone is a shaitan who calls to it. And then the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he recited the ayah in the Quran in Surah Al-An'am وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاتِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ That this is my straight path. So again, as we are going through all of these verses, we are making a connection between all of these verses. The very first verse, the path of the prophets and the truthful and then Surah Al-Fatiha, and then this ayah here. So we're connecting all these verses together. So in this verse, this is my straight path. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا This is a straight, same path in Surah Al-Fatiha. It's the same path, the path of the prophets, and the truthful, and the martyrs, and the righteous. It's the same path in the, in the one in Surah Al-Nahl. So follow it. Follow this path. And do not follow the other paths. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُ subal. So he described the other paths in the plural, subal. And then he said, such that it separates you from his path. Now commenting upon this ayah, Mujahid, one of the commentators, Mufassirin from the Salaf, he said, Al-Bida' wa Shubuhat. Al-Bida' wa Shubuhat. Meaning that the subal, the paths which are mentioned in this ayah, they're referring to the bid'ah and the shubuhat, the innovations and the misconceptions, the doubts which are brought. And likewise, we see another one from the Salaf, Al-Bikr bin Ala. He said, Ahsabuhu arada shaytanan min al-ins wa hiya al-bid'ah. So he said, I believe and I think that he intended a devil from amongst the men. Meaning in the hadith, when the messenger of Allah he said at the end of each path is a shaitan. He meant a shaitan from the men. From the men. And this refers, wahi al bid'a, And this, this refers to the innovations. It refers to the ways and the paths of innovation. So, from all of this introduction, from all of these verses from the Quran, our intent was to explain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has explained that there is a single path which leads to paradise, which if a person wants to be on that path, along with the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs and the righteous, that he must be upon that path. And that path is the path of sound beneficial knowledge, and righteous action. It is obedience to Allah and obedience to His Messenger. It is a path of ni'mah and fadl, bounty and favor. This is what a person must be upon. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is warned us of the paths which are ja'ir and the subal, which are to the right and to the left, to avoid all of those paths, because those are paths that lead to the hellfire. Now, after all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now established for us two scales of balance. There are two, there are two, the, two mizans, there are two scales of balance. How do we know what is this path? And those two scales of balance, first and foremost, is the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let's bring the proofs for this scale from the Quran, from the sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Say, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. We see in another ayah, Allah has conditioned obedience to Allah with obedience to the Messenger. He said, وَمَنْ يُطِئِ الرَّسُولِ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ Whoever obeys the Messenger, then he has indeed obeyed Allah. At Surah An-Nisa, Surah 4, verse number 80. مَنْ يُتِئِ الرَّسُولِ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ 
whoever obeys the, me- the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah. Then we see in the famous ayah in Surah, Surah Ali Imran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ To the end of the ayah, say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me, make ittiba of me. Allah will love you and he will forgive you your sins. From all of these verses, which are only a small sample of many verses we could bring to indicate the obligation of following the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and specifically his Sunnah because these ayat indicate his Sunnah. So there are many ayat which indi- indicate the obligation of following the Sunnah but we see that Imam Ahmad has explained what is this Sunnah. He said, وَالسُنَّةُ إِنْدَنَا آثَارُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه That the Sunnah in our view with us are the athar, the narrations from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَالسُنَّةُ تُفَسِّرُ الْقُرْآنِ that the Sunnah explains the Qur'an. وَهِيَ دَلَائِلُ الْقُرْآنِ And the Sunnah is something which points to the meanings of the Qur'an. وَلَيْسَ فِي سُنَّةِ قِيَاسِ وَلَا تُدْرَبُ لَهَا الْأَمْثَالِ وَلَا تُدْرَكُ بِالْأُقُولِ وَلَا الْأَحْوَى And the Sunnah isn't something for which analogies can be made, and nor something for which likenesses and similitudes are made, nor is it something that can be grasped by the intellects or the desires. Rather, إِنَّمَا هُوَ الْإِتِّبَاءِ وَتَرْكُ الْحَوَى Rather, it is something which is where you merely follow and imitate and you abandon the desire. So, in summary, in essence, this is the first scale and the first measure which a person uses in order to gauge himself and others to see is he on that path with the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, the righteous, upon ilmun nafi wal amru salih, وَالْحُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ This is the first criterion. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't limit the scale and the balance only to this. Rather, He added to this something else. And this is a crucial scale of balance which distinguishes the people of the truth, the people of unity, the people of sunnah, the people of jama'ah from every other claimant who makes a claim. And this is the second mizan, the second scale, and this is the scale of following the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And there are numerous evidences in the Qur'an for this as well, before we even arrive at the Sunnah. So from the Qur'an, the most famous of them, which you are familiar with, is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِكِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِئْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ that whoever contends with the messenger so this is clear to everybody the messenger sunnah making it about the messenger obeying the messenger whoever contends with the messenger even after the guidance has been made clear to him what is the guidance al-ilm al-nafi the guidance in this ayah مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْحُدَى Huda we know to be الْإِلْمُ النَّافِعِ The beneficial knowledge has been made clear to him. And he chooses a path, he follows a path, other than the path of the believers, meaning the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم. Then we shall abandon him and leave him in the path he has chosen and burn him in hellfire. What an evil, what an evil refuge. See, notice here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the one who chooses misguidance he leaves him upon that path in other words a person chooses misguidance for himself this shows that guidance is a favor from Allah because a, a person who is guided it is from the favor and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why? because Allah brings and gives something additional to a servant by which he is guided. But as for misguidance, it is merely Allah leaving a servant to his own devices because a servant has shown he does not want guidance. So Allah leaves him. Meaning Allah is not unjust. Allah does not, Allah does not unjustly misguide anybody. Rather one who is misguided is deserving of misguidance because he chose that. But the point being here, that here as you know, that following other than the path of the believers means the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the uh, evidence that the Salaf have taken from this ayah is clear that they, that they indicate the following of the obligation 
of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Then the second ayah which is also used as you know, uh, Surah At-Tawbah verse 100, وَسَابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُحَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنْسَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ بِإِحْسَانٍ رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه. The foremost in good deeds from the Muhajirin and the Ansar and those who follow them بِإِحْسَانٍ بِإِحْسَانٍ Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan he explains that this word إِحْسَان it means إِتْقَان it means itqan, mean, meaning whoever follows them in precision, with itqan, whoever follows them in precision, then Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. This is another proof to show that this is a scale, this is a, a measuring scale of the truth and its people following the Sahaba. And some of the Salaf has said that this applies to Yawm al Qiyamah. Everyone who follows the Sahaba in goodness, this applies to them up until Yawm al Qiyamah. The third proof, the third proof is in Surah Al-Baqarah and this ayah was originally revealed in relation to the Christians. But as you know that an ayah can be revealed in relation to a specific situation even though its meaning applies in a more general sense. So in this ayah Allah says, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِحْتَدَوْا That if they believe in the likes of that which you believe, then they are indeed guided. And the one being addressed here is the Messenger of Allah and the Sahaba. Because he mentioned, بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ Speaking in the plural, meaning the Messenger and the Sahaba, then they are indeed guided. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 137. And we finish with one more ayah from many ayat in the Qur'an. And this is in Surah, surah Al-Luqman, in which we read, وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ Allah is commanding follow, make ittiba of the path, the sabil of the one who turns back to me. Who is this referring to? Imam al-Baghawi rahimahullah ta'ala in his tafsir, he explains a number of opinions. First is that it refers to the Prophet and his companions together. And the second, another view is that he explains as uh, as is explained by Ibn Abbas himself, he explained this ayah. He said, radiyallahu anhuma, he said, this ayah is in relation to Abu Bakr, radiyallahu anhu. He became a Muslim. Then there came to him five from the Sahaba, who became Sahaba. Uthman, radiyallahu anhu, Talha, Az Zubair, Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas, and Abdurrahman bin Auf. These five, they came to him, and they said to him that this man that you believe in, is he, is he really truthful? Tell us, is he, is, he, is he sadiq? Is he really truthful? Is he really speaking the truth? So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, he gave da'wah to them, he explained to them the truthful of the Messenger of Allah And as a result of that, they accepted Islam at the hands of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. So this ayah is referring to this group of Sahaba, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and all of those Sahaba, the father who, who entered into Islam on account of him. So, وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْ Follow the path or the way of those who make who turn back to me. This is a fourth proof and fourth evidence to show the obligation of following the understanding of the Sahaba. So now, where we are leading to is that this ni'mah, this bounty, this fadl, this favor, this path which leads to paradise, which is the sirat, as in one ayah, which is the sabil in another ayah, all of that is one and the same thing, and it has two scales of balance. It is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it is, the, it is the, the way of the Sahaba, meaning in their understanding of the religion, and in their application of the religion, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now all of this was from the Qur'an. All of this is from the Qur'an. And as from the Sunnah, we will mention only two proofs for the sake of brevity. And both of these proofs you are familiar with and you know very well. The first of those proofs is the famous hadith of uh, Al-Irbad bin Sariya radiallahu anhu about the sermon that was given in which he said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave a sermon by which the hearts were moved and the eyes, they shed tears. 
And then they said, give us an admonition, O Messenger of Allah So he said to them that I have left you upon absolute clarity. Is night is like its day. Is night is like its day. And whoever, no one leaves it or abandons it except that he will perish. And whoever amongst you lives for long, وَمَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَصِيرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا To the end of the hadith, that he will see a great deal of controversy. So upon you is to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guarded khulafa. And bite onto it with your molars for indeed, and beware of the newly invented matters, for every newly invented matter is an innovation. So this hadith is something that establishes for us everything that we saw in the Qur'an from the ayat of the Qur'an. Meaning that the path of truth and deliverance is one, which is the sunnah upon the way of the sahaba, and that the ways of controversy are many. There are much ways of controversy, many ways of controversy. And then the hadith, the second hadith is the hadith, the famous hadith of splitting and iftiraq, which is the hadith in which we see that the messenger of Allah he said that indeed you will split that the Yahud split into 72 sects and you will split into 73 sects. My Ummah will split into 73 sects. And all of them are in the hellfire except for one. And they are ma ana alihi al wa ashabi, those who are upon what I and I are upon today and my companions are upon today. So our intention here is to bring only two a hadith from the Sunnah out of many for the sake of brevity to establish what we've established from the, from the Quran. So, from all of this we see that the path, to, the path to paradise is the way of the sunnah and it is only one path. There is only one path to sunnah. And the path to misguidance and to hellfire and the controversies are many, many, many different paths. And at this point, we should make a mention here of a misguided innovator. Someone who is misguided upon knowledge. He is a dalun mudillun. And he knows he is a dalun mudillun. And he is a man by the name of Yasir Qadi. This man is a man upon whom the hujja is established. Meaning, the truth is already known to him. He knows the truth. Because if you spend 10 years studying in the city of Medina with the ulama, it means that you can't leave except that the hujja the proof is already established upon you. Now this man is a misguided innovator and he claims, he claims in one of his lectures that these are hadith that we are discussing. The hadith, the hadith which, which is actually accepted by all of the ulama, which, 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 all, which is almost mutawatir in meaning because it's reported by so many of the, of the, of the, of the sahaba. He says that this hadith is misunderstood. And then he mixes truth with falsehood. He mixes truth with falsehood because he thinks himself to be sophisticated. So he brings three correct misconceptions about this hadith which are correct. And this is the honey in which there is poison. So from those affairs which are correct, from the correct misconceptions that he brings, are for example, that this hadith is expelling all of those 72 sects from Islam. This is not correct. The hadith is not actually saying this. Right? So in other words, he brings a number of misconceptions which are in fact genuine. Or for example, that anyone who is from these sects, he will never enter paradise. Sorry, he will never enter the fire. Or he will never enter paradise. This again is a misconception. This is, this is incorrect as well. So he brings certain misconceptions which are indeed correct and which, 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 are, which, which the scholars have spoken with. Then he brings the poison because the guard has been removed. And remember, he is speaking on a platform, an ikhwani platform, and he is speaking in a gathering in which the Shia are present and between whom there is an understanding between the Shia and the Sunnah. Uh, a, a mutual understanding. He's speaking in this platform and to this audience. This is where he's speaking. And so he says that this had that he brings a misconception and he says he says that that historically speaking when we look at all of these 73 sects 
we see that the actual people in these sects were very, very small in number. They were very, very small in number. And as for the overwhelming majority of the Ummah, then they are upon the truth, he says. Why? What is his evidence? He brings other ahadith which actually don't really apply to the situation. Those other ahadith he brings, they speak about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how the majority of the people of paradise will be from this ummah. Right? These are other hadith he is bringing, right? Which, he has, which, he, which, which really don't apply to the actual situation here. Because what we are speaking of here is, when we speak about these hadith and verses, is that we are speaking of a person being saved from entering into hellfire to begin with. We do not want anybody from the Muslims to enter into the hellfire. Why? Because entering paradise does not mean you will not enter hellfire first. So, when we call to the sunnah, when we call to the jama'ah, what we are trying to do is we want every single Muslim to not enter hellfire. Rather, we want him and we desire for him as we desire for ourselves that he enter into paradise without being punished. However, it doesn't mean that a Muslim will not enter hellfire first. Of course he will. Now the evidences that Yasir Qadi is bringing are those evidences which are general, which say for example that the majority of the inhabitants of paradise will be from this Ummah, which is correct. But that does not mean that they will be from those who entered into paradise, who actually entered into hellfire first. So the, so the evidences he is bringing for his batil those evidences do not actually support him in what he is saying. What he's trying to say is that the majority of the Ummah is upon truth and upon guidance. And as for the sect, what is meant by firqa is the individual and the small number of individuals who are responsible for the, for the firqa. So in other words, really what he's trying to say is Dhul Khuwaisra At-Tamimi and from the Ru'us of the Khawarij and from the Ru'us of the Qadariya and from the Ru'us of the Jahmiya, Jahm himself, and maybe two, three of his supporters, and likewise from the Ru'us of the Mu'tazila, Amr bin Ubaid, Wasil bin Ata, and the few of the, the followers, and from the, this is what he's trying to say, that, the, that these are the ones who are from the Firaq. But as for the overwhelming majority of the Ummah, then they are from the people of truth, from the people of the Sunnah, from the people of the Jama'ah, and this year, Ikhwan, is, is, is the greatest of Batil, and he, he says this whilst he knows the truth. Bila shak ya, ya, ya ikhwan. There's no excuse for this man. He says this while he knows the haq and while he knows the truth. So, uh, coming back to where we left off, we said that the path to paradise is one and the path to hellfire, the paths to hellfire are very many. And this now leads us to the verses in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are many verses in the Quran in which Allah mentions the spitting and the differing. And what we want to establish is that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, who were nurtured and taught by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they were promised by the Messenger of Allah that they would see certain things, like in the hadith of Al Irbad and the hadith of the splitting. They were taught by the Messenger that you will see certain things. So when they saw certain things, they went to the Qur'an and they took certain verses of the Qur'an and they applied them to the spitting and the differing that they saw. So when we look in the Qur'an and we see all of the verses that mention the splitting and the differing of the nations who came before us, from the Yahud, from the Jews, and from the Christians likewise. By way of example, uh, Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعَ to the end of the ayah Those who split their religion and turn into sects and parties This is one example of an ayah Another ayah وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ Do not become like those who split and differed After clear evidences came to them Also the saying of Allah وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعَا Do not be like those who, who Like the pagans who split their religion and turn into parties and sects. So you know all of these verses. Now the point that we want to make is, how did the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, anhum, when they saw the people of innovation, how did they apply these verses? 
And this we understand by looking at the following narrations that Imam al-Shatibi brings in his book Al-I'tisam. Abu Umama, he applied the verse in Surat Ali Imran, the verse which mentions about holding to the rope of Allah and not spitting. He says, they are humul haruriyya. They are the khawarij. Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said, he applied uh, this verse, the same verse, he's talking about the khawarij. He said, they threw by the Lord of the Kaaba these verses behind their backs. Likewise, we have narrations from uh, Mujahid. We already mentioned that narration earlier on, in fact. We have narrations from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, who said, these verses nazalat fi hadhihi al-ummah. They were revealed in relation to this ummah. Abu Umama said, humul khawarij. They are from the khawarij. And likewise, uh, Ibn Abbas, he said regarding the ayah, aw yalbisakum shia'ah. He said, uh, hul, hum, uh, he said, huwa al-ahwa al-mukhtalifa. They are the various desires. The various uh, desires. Likewise, we have the statement of Mujahid regarding the saying of Allah, وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمُ رَبُّكَ They will never continue differing except those upon whom is Allah's mercy. He says, إِنَّهُمْ أَهْلُ batil They are the people of falsehood. And Ikrimah, he said, they are the أَهْلُ Ahwa, And they are the people of desires. And so the point, Ya Ikhwan, there are many narrations for the sake of brevity, we want to be brief. The point that we want to make here is that when the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, when they saw with their eyes what the messenger prophesied to them would happen in this ummah, they immediately understood all of the verses in the Quran that criticized and condemned the Jews and Christians for spitting and differing. They applied them to the khawarij and to the rafida and to the Murji'a and the Qadariya and all of the people of, of desires. Right? So it shows and it proves that those paths that are mentioned in the ayah, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُ subul, and those paths which are jair from that ayah that we mentioned, all of those paths are the paths of innovation, of bid'ah, and dalala, and misguidance. And all of this we are establishing from evidences from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah. So, from all of this introduction, we see that in the Qur'an, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the Sirat, He's mentioned the Sabil, we see mention of the, the Sunnah in, in, in the Athar, we see mention of Al-Huda, we see mention of Ilm al nafi we see the connection to, that, to, the, to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and in contrast to all of that, we see Ikhtilaf, and tafriq, and we see jair, you know, the deviation, we see subal, multiple paths, we see ahwa, we see bid'a, we see all of these different ways and paths which lead to the hellfire. So now this leads us to the, to the, to the, what I was leading with all of this, inshallah ta'ala, all of this introduction, was to come and read from a book written by an alim, so all of my lectures so far really was to lead to this quotation that I'm going to bring from this alim. And this alim is a great imam from the Salaf. He died, in fact he was killed in the year 231 Hijra. 231 Hijra. And his name, his name is Ahmed, Ahmed bin Nasr al-Khuza'i. Ahmed bin Nasr al-Khuza'i. And let me tell you about this Imam. Ahmed bin Nasr al-Khuzai, his name, in fact he's described as al-Hafidh, al-Mujahid, al-Dhabu an sunnah Ahmed bin Nasr bin Malik, Ibn al-Haytham bin Awf al-Khuzai. He's ascribed to the tribe of, uh, to a certain tribe of Khuzai. Now this Imam, he was someone who met Imam Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And he met the, the great Imams of the Salaf in that time at the end of the second century after Hijrah. Let's see what some of the scholars have said about him. Imam al Dhahabi said, Imam al Dhahabi said, Kana Ahmed bin Nasr, Shaykhan Jalilan, Ammaran bil Ma'roof, Qawwalan bil Haq, Min Awladil Umara. He was a lofty, noble Shaykh. 
He used to command the good, prohibit the evil. And likewise, we see Jamal al Jamal al Mizzi. He said, "Wakana Ahmed bin Nasr hada min ahli al ilm wa din wal fadl, mashhuran bil khair, amaran bil ma'roof, wa qawwalan bil haq." That he was from the people of knowledge and excellence and virtue. He was well known for enjoining the good and prohibiting the evil and speaking the truth. And Yahya bin Ma'in, Yahya bin Ma'in, he was the student of Ahmed bin Nasr. He would ask for Allah's mercy upon Ahmed bin Nasr. And he would say, Khatam Allahu lahu bishahada. Allah sealed him with martyrdom. And there are many other narrations from the Salaf to explain the virtue of this Imam. Now, who are his teachers? From his teachers, as we said, is Imam Malik bin Anas radiyallahu anhu, rahimahullah ta'ala. And likewise, Hamad bin Zayd is from his teachers. <clears throat> likewise, Sufyan bin Uyayna, rahimahullah ta'ala. And likewise, uh, many of the, uh, the prominent scholars from the second century. So you see that we are dealing with an Imam who is the student of the greatest Imams of the second century after Hijrah. Now, this Imam, when we look at his biography and his way, we see that he was someone who was preoccupied in enjoining the good and prohibiting the evil and striving in the path of Allah and defending the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And in specific, in the time of Imam Ahmad, in the tribulation of the creation of the Qur'an. Now we want to mention the story behind his murder and his killing. So let's listen to this story a little while. And we see that Imam Al-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned this story in some detail. We want to paraphrase, we want to paraphrase this story to try and summarize it as much as possible. Now, Ahmad bin Nasr al-Khuzai, he was someone who used to be visited by all of the major imams of hadith. Yahya bin Ma'in would, would come to his house. Ibn Khaythama would come to his house. And he was known and famous for openly rejecting the statement that the Qur'an is created. This was in a time when Al-Ma'moon was the leader. And when you would be put to trial and you would be taken and brought to the leaders if you were showing rejection against this statement. So he would openly proclaim his rejection against this statement of kufr. And he was, he would, he would, uh, anyone who began to speak with this, he would launch his tongue against him. Right? This is how he was, he would speak against this belief. So what happened is that a number of people, they conspired together. They conspired together to get Ahmed bin Nasr in front of the ruler at the time. This is in the year 230-231. And they, they try to make an excuse, they try to make it look as if Ahmed bin Nasr is someone who is attempting to revolt and make a rebellion against the ruler Al-Wathiq. Al -Wathiq. So the story goes that there were certain people, there were many people who were paid certain dinars and they came to the town and city and they waited and conspired. So eventually, we want to leave all of the details of the story. Eventually, the chief of police, the chief of police, he was a man, uh, there was a, a, a name given to the, to the uh, chief of police named Muhammad bin Ibrahim. He eventually came to the house of Ahmed bin Nasr. And they requested to search the house of Ahmed bin Nasr. And Ahmed bin Nasr, he said, you are more than welcome to come to my house. If you see any weapon or any means of preparation or whatever, then by all means, you can take me. But you can see that I'm not, I'm not preparing anything in revolution or revolt. So what they did was they took Ahmed bin Nasr along with five other people and they carried them to the ruler Al-Wathiq. Al-Wathiq, he is the same ruler who was putting Imam Ahmed to trial. So then he was brought in front of Al-Wathiq, he was taken away from Baghdad and taken to a place called Samura and he was carried on donkeys and all of this is in the year 231 Hijrah on the final night before Ramadan in Sha'ban on the final night before Ramadan 
So now what al wathiq did is he gathered all of his, you know, the, the, his companions from the heads of the Jahmiya, from from Ibn Abi Duad, you know, all of these famous people who put Imam Ahmed to trial, Ibn Abi Duad and the other people. So they're all brought together in a majlis, in a gathering. And what happened is that this ruler, al wathiq because the pretext was that you are trying to revolt against me. You are trying to make khuruj against me. However, the debate and the argument that followed was nothing to do with the khuruj, which means that the khuruj was just really a pretext to, to, grab, this, to grab this imam. So they began the debate. It was said to Ahmed bin Nasr, what do you say regarding the Qur'an? And so he said, Kalamullah, it is the speech of Allah. And Ahmed bin Nasr, he would he would already prepared himself for death. And he'd already, you know, put uh, perfume upon himself. He'd come prepared because he knew what he expected. So then it was said to him, is it created or what? And so he said, huwa kalamullah. Huwa kalamullah, it is the speech of Allah. This is the ruler saying this to him. So then the ruler said to him, فَمَا تَقُولْ فِي رَبِّكْ أَتَرَاهُ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ What do you say regarding your Lord? Will you see him on يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, يَا أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ جَاءَتِ الْآثَارَ عَنُّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أَنَّهُ قَالْ تَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كَمَا تَرَوْنَ الْقَمَرِ لَا تُدَامُونَ فِي رُؤْيَتِهِ So he said, O oh, chief of the believers, there are narrations which have come from the Messenger of Allah Wasallam that he said, you will see your Lord on يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ as you see the moon without you having to compete with each other to see. To, to, to see. So we فَنَحْنُ عَلَى الْخَبَرِ we are followers of the narration. And then he said, وَحَدَّثَنِي Sufyan bin Uyayna Then he's narrating directly from Sufyan bin Uyayna who said, Indeed, the heart of the sons of Adam are between the two fingers from the fingers of, Ar of, of Allah. And he turns it however he wills. And the, Pro and the Prophet ﷺ, he used to make a supplication. يَا مُقَلِّبَ الْقُلُوبِ ثَبِّتْ قَلْبِ إِلَى دِينِكَ Or turn of the hearts, Make firm my heart upon your deen. So he's bringing all of these statements from the Messenger of Allah as, as evidence for his belief in these in the in, in, in these beliefs. So then the chief of police, who is Ishaq, uh, one of one of the people present, he said, "Woe be to you! Look at what you are saying." He said, uh, and so Ahmed bin Nasr said, "But you are the one who commanded me with this." He's saying to the chief of police, "You are the one who told me to say this." So this chief of police became surprised and said, How? How have I commanded you to say this? He said, Because you are the one who told me and commanded me that I should give sincere advice to the chief of the believers, to the ruler. And I am giving sincere advice to the chief of the believers. I am advising him, I am advising him not to oppose, to oppose the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, after all of this discussion, al wathiq he said to the people around him, so he's got all of these heads of the Jahmiyyah, Ibn Abi Duad, and there's others around him. He said, what do you say I should do with him? What do you say about this man? So one of them, called Abdurrahman Ibn Saq, he said, he used to be a Qadi. He said, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, huwa halal dam O chief of the believers, his blood is halal. His blood is halal. Another one called Abu, uh, he is called Abu Abdullah Al Urmani. He said, he said, uh, he said, make his blood flow for me, O chief of the believers. Right. So another one of these, he said to the ruler, make his blood flow. So then Al Wathiq, after he sought the advice and opinion consultation of these people of these Jahmiya, he said, Al Qatlu Yati Alama Turid. He said, death will come as you wish. So then, Ibn Abi, da, Ibn Abi Duad, who is one of those chief instigators, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, kafirun yustatab. He said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, this is a kafir. He need, his repentance needs to be sought. And maybe this man, he's, you know, some, some things afflicted his intellect. Maybe he's mad. Maybe something's wrong with him. Right, so he's pretending 
as if he doesn't want him to be killed, but he really wants him to be killed, right? So then al wathiq said, al wathiq then says, if you stand me, if you see me standing towards him, do not anyone come and stand in front of me. <laughs> so then he ordered for a certain special type of sword to be brought. This sword had a special name. Why? Because it was a sword that was actually given as gift to a ruler after a ruler. And it was kept in a special box. So the sword was brought out. So al wathiq he brought out the sword. Then they had Ahmed bin Nasr. His head was tied with a rope. And his feet were tied with a rope. And then al wathiq he came. He struck him once on the neck. Then he struck him twice on the neck. Then he also took him and he also stabbed him in the belly. And then he eventually he was decapitated. His head was taken off. Then, now, there's a point in all of this story, so we will come to it, inshallah, at the end of the, 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 the lesson. So then his head was taken, his head was taken, and it was taken to, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the main town, to the main area, and it was put in certain parts of the city, a few weeks in one part of the city, and then moved a few weeks in another part of the city. And in his ear, there was a scroll in which there was written something. And in this scroll, there was written, هَذَا رَأْسُ الْكَافِرْ الْمُشْرِكْ الضَّالِ This is the head of the mushrik, disbeliever, misguided one. وَهُوَ أَحْمَدْ بِنْ نَصَرْ بِنْ مَالِكْ And he is Ahmed bin Nasr bin Malik. من ممن قتله الله على يدي عبد الله حارون الإمام الواثق بالله أمير المؤمنين. He is the one who is killed, who is killed by Allah. He is killed by Allah upon the hands of Abdullah Harun, the Imam الواثق بالله أمير المؤمنين. بعد أن أقام عليه الحجة في خلق القرآن ونفي التشبيه. After al wathiq established the proof upon him regarding the creation of the Qur'an and negating tashbih, and he presented to him tawbah, وَمَكَّنَهُ مِنَ الرُّجُوءِ إِلَى الْحَقِّ And he made it possible for him to return to, to the truth. فَأَبَى إِلَّا الْمُعَانَدَةَ وَالتَّصْرِيحِ But he, Ahmed, denied except that he should, he should be stubborn and explicit upon his kufr. وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ أَلَّذِي عَجَّلَ بِهِ إِلَى نَارِهِ وَعَلِيمْ إِقَابِهِ And all praise is due to Allah who hastened him, Ahmad bin Nasr, to the fire, to his fire, and his severe torment. وَإِنَّ أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ سَعَلَهُ عَنْ ذَلِكَ فَأَقَرَّ بِالتَّشْبِيحِ وَتَكَلَّمَ بِالْكُفَرْ فَاسْتَحَلَّ بِذَلِكَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ دَمَهُ وَلَعَنَهُ So he says the Amir al-Mu'mineen, he asked him about this, but he affirmed this tashbih and he spoke with kufr. So the Amir al muminin he made his blood halal and he cursed him. Now, this was in a scroll written in the ear of the head of this Imam of the Sunnah. And this was the message that was given to the people. And then not only this, but there were 20 or so people who were known to be from the associates and companions of Ahmad bin Nasr. And all of them were taken prisoner. And they were taken and they were kept in dungeons without any light. And eventually they were made to die. They were made to die upon that as well. Now, Ya Ikhwan, this story of this Imam, sometimes when we, when we, the reason behind the story is because we're going to read a few statements from this Imam. And when you, when you understand the life and the da'wah of this imam, remember this imam, he used to go out with a group of people and actively warn against the creation of the Qur'an in a time in which you would be captured and taken and put in front of the ruler and be executed. Right? This is why the scholars described him as someone who is ammaran bil, bil khair, you know, someone who commands the good and prohibits the evil. This is what he used to do. 
He used to go out and he used to go with people going to towns and cities and warning against the creation of the Qur'an. So, when you look into the life and the history of an imam, you greater appreciate the statements or the book that he's written. That's why when we read Usul al-Sunnah, we read the biography of Imam Ahmad, and then what we, re- what we read becomes even more meaningful in our, in our souls. When we read the books of Ibn Taymiyyah like Aqidatul Wasithiyya, al Hamawiya, and we go and read his biography, then it takes on even a greater meaning in our hearts and significance in our hearts. When we read the life and biography and the striving of this Imam and what he went through, then his words now become even more valuable and precious and we, we take them much more seriously. So, now that you understand this Imam and what he basically uh, went through, now this is a book, it's called Al-I'tisam bil Kitabi wa Sunnah. It's written by, by, the, by this Imam Ahmed bin Nasr al-Khuzai. And it's, it's a lengthy book and I don't have much time to go through everything. But you see in this book, he brings many of the evidences which I quoted to you at the beginning of the, of, of the lecture about the splitting and about the sabil and all of the ahadith that you find mentioning about the jama'ah and the sunnah and the sahaba remember this is a time in the in 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 just after the second century after hijrah and he's writing a book in that time as if you see as if you're reading the writing of Sheikh al-Bani in our time like when we when we explain salafiyah now in our time what do we do we mention the hadith of iftiraq we mentioned the hadith of following the, 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 the Sahaba, you know, not, not, you know, not making, uh, not contending with the messenger. We mentioned all of those hadith. We mentioned the hadith of Al-Irbad bin Sariya. We mentioned the hadith of the Iftiraq of the 73 sects. We mentioned the hadith of the holding onto the coals, like Islam will come like you're holding onto the coals. All of these texts, you see that this Imam, he's actually brought all of these texts, he brought them together in holding to the, to the Sunnah. It's as if, you would see what we today, we, we everything, every evidence we write, he's put this book together in the same way. Now the point that I want to come to is that he brings a narration here. And if there's one lesson that you take from the whole of this talk today, then it's this narration. If there's one thing that you're going to write from the lesson today, it's this narration. Right? And if you write this and you go away with this, alhamdulillah, you've benefited from, from the lesson in the desired way. So he says in this book, Haddathana Muhammad bin Idris. Muhammad bin Idris is not Imam al-Shafi'i, it's another Imam who happened to have the same name. He says, Haddathana Muhammad bin Idris. Thana, meaning Haddathana Ibrahim bin Muhammad bin Yusuf al-Firyabi. Al-Firyabi. So Muhammad bin Idris narrated to us that Ibrahim bin Muhammad bin Yusuf al-Firyabi narrated to us. Haddathana Ayyub bin Suwaid. That Ayyub bin Suwaid narrated to us. Sami'tu al-Awza'i. So the Isnad goes back to Imam al-Awza'i. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Sami'tu al-Awza'i yaqul I heard Imam Al-Awza'i say, Kana yuqal. Kana yuqal. It used to be said. It used to be said. He could only be taking this from his teachers. From those who came before him, which means from the tabi, tabi'een, from the tabi'een. This is where he's taken this statement from. So this statement really is coming to you from those before him, from the tabi'een. What, what, what was it that used to be said? So this now is the, 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 the lesson. مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ Now, as you read this, you have to bring together, you have to bring all this together, you have to bring the story of Ahmed bin Nasr al-Khuzai, because that's the intention behind bringing the statement of Ahmed bin Nasr al-Khuzai, the story that you see what, what he went through. مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ There is no Muslim إلا وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ عَلَىٰ ثُغْرَةٍ مِنْ ثُغَرِ الْإِسْلَامِ There is no Muslim except that he is standing guard 
on a border or a frontier from the frontiers of Islam. So in other words, there is no Muslim. Every single Muslim is, sta it is as if he is standing on one of the outer border regions of Islam and he is standing, qa'imun, he is standing there as, as a guard. فمن استطاع ألا يؤتى الإسلام من ثغرته فليفعل. So he said, so whoever is able that Islam is not attacked from his position, then let him do so. Then let him do so. Let me read that again. ما من مسلم إلا وهو قائم إلا إلا وهو قائم على ثغرة من ثغر الإسلام. There is no Muslim, every single Muslim. It is as if he is standing on the outer border regions of Islam. Because the border regions is where the battles and excursions take place and the infiltrations take place and so on and so forth. So every Muslim is like this. So whoever is able, فَمَنِ اسْتِطَاعَ أَلَّا يُؤْتَى الْإِسْلَامُ مِنْ ثُغْرَتِهِ فَيَفْعَلْ So whoever is able that Islam is not attacked from his specific, his place, then let him, let him do so. And let him do so. In other words, ya Ikhwan, you see, the, the example of Ahmed bin uh, Khuzai, who is the, who actually brought this narration to us in his book, Al-I'tisamu bil kitabi wa sunnah. Look at the example of Ahmed bin uh, Nasr al-Khuzai, and look at what he did. And look at his eventual outcome, how he was, inshallah ta'ala, martyred in defending the aqidah of the people of Islam, of the people of the sunnah. But this leads us uh, really to the, he then brings uh, the narration of the, the hadith in which the Messenger he said that upon you is patience because behind you are days of patience in which the one who holds on to, to his way is like the one who holds on to the coals and the one who acts he will have 50 the likes of 50 amounts of reward from the people amongst you you know this hadith he mentions this hadith and then after this he goes on and I want to finish with a passage here which really summarizes everything that we've mentioned in this lesson so he says after mentioning this hadith he says وَمَدَحَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ الَّذِينَ قَبِلُوا he, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He praised those who accepted from the messenger of Allah What the messenger conveyed to them from Allah And he praised them And they are the muhajirun and the ansar From the companions of the messenger of Allah And he gave an example of them Like the example which is in the Torah and the Injil He said about them Muhammadur Rasulullah Walladheena ma'ahu ashidda'u wal al-kufar Ruhama'u baynahum That Muhammad is the messenger of Allah Those who are with him are severe against the unbelievers and, and merciful amongst themselves. And he said also, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ that, al that Allah is pleased with the believers when they gave the Pledge of Allegiance beneath the tree. So therefore, فَهُمْ حُجَّةُ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ بَعْدَ رَسُولِهِ وسلم. So they, meaning the Sahaba, are the hujja of Allah upon His creation after His Messenger. They fulfill and they convey what the Messenger of Allah conveyed to them. This is because he ordered them, لِيُبَلِّغُ الشَّاهِدُ مِنْكُمُ الْغَائِبِ Because he ordered the Sahaba, let the one who is present convey to the one who is absent. So they continued upon the minhaj of their Prophet, following the ruling of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and the Messenger of Allah, he, conveyed, he praised them as well. So he said about them, خَيْرُ nas qarni. They are the best, the best of generation is my generation. He ordered with following their sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guarded khulafa. And he warned his ummah from the muhdathat, from the newly invented things which were innovated after him. And he informed that they are, in a, they are an innovation and that Allah has reviled them and anyone who innovated into the deen of Allah from those nations who came before. And then he prohibited us from prohibit from from innovating because he said am lahum shuraka'u shara'u lahum min ad-din ma lam ya'dhan bihi Allah do they have partners who've legislated for them that which Allah never gave them any permission so the messenger of Allah he legislated legislations 
and he instituted sunnas by the permission of his Lord and by revelation, not from himself. Because Allah says, مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحِنْ يُهَى that your, that your companion has not gone astray, rather he speaks only, for, nor does he speak from his desire, he speaks only by way of revelation. So it continues and he says that, that the Prophet informed us that we shall follow the ways of those who came before us and we shall follow their ways and tracks and that we shall innovate some of us just like they innovated. You mentioned the hadith, La tarakabunna sunan man kana qablakum, you will certainly follow the ways of those who came before you. And he said also the most of which I fear upon my ummah are the stars, rejection of al-qadr and misguiding leaders and scholars. And Allah, he freed his prophet al uh, from those who split their religion and become parties and sects from having anything to do with the messenger and he ordered us to follow his sabil in the book and the sunnah and this is what the akhbar the narrations have come from the messenger of Allah sallam and we have mentioned some of them and he continues to mention more of them to the to the end of what he mentions now to to conclude our lesson we 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 gave the example of this imam really to show, to illustrate the path that we mentioned right at the very beginning, the path which is the path of those that Allah has favored and blessed, uh, uh, the path of the the, Nabi, the the prophets and the martyrs and the uh, truthful people and the righteous, the path of al-ilm al-nafi wal amal al-salih, that this is an exemplification of an imam who stood and spoke the truth in the face of falsehood when he knew his eventual, what his outcome would be. And at the same time, he gave us an advice. The advice he gave in the statement of Imam al-Awza'i is an advice that he implemented to the first degree in his own life. Why? Because he, he saw himself as an imam, as a person, as a Muslim, stood in the border regions of the Muslim lands who is doing his part in order to defend you know, Islam and not to allow any compromise or any, any, any weakness. So all of this, it shows us that if we are people who are people who want to be upon that path, the path of righteous knowledge, the path of righteous action, the path with the prophets and messengers, the path of, of guidance, then it means that we have to stick to the Mizan. The Mizan is the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in understanding the religion upon their way in understanding the aqidah, the manhaj, the, the tawheed the mu'amalat, the akhlaq, everything in everything and that every single person who adheres to this way of the sunnah and the jama'ah and of the Sahaba then to the extent that he is able within his limits and following the ulama and following the scholars he should never ever allow Salafiyya, because Salafiyya is synonymous with the Islam that we are speaking of. Salafiyya and Islam and Sunnah, all of it is the same and one thing. That he should stand and speak with whatever is in his limits to speak and defend the truth. Whether it be defending the ulama, the scholars of Ahlul wal Jama'ah in our time, Ibn Baz, Al-Albani, Sheikh Muqbil, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, and those who are alive, Sheikh Al-Fawzan, to speak in defense of their honor or whether it be in defense of the people upon the Salafiyyah from the Marakis and the Masajid and the callers to defend them because why? we see ya Ikhwan we are in a time we are in a time which is multiple 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 times more worse than the time of Ahmad bin Nasr al khuzai or those who came before him because the innovations have spread and multiplied multiplied become more and more and more so our point is that every single person of the sunnah, that it is from the way of truth to be a person who speaks the truth. One who speaks the truth, one who knows the truth, understands the scholars of the truth, and the people who associate with the scholars of the truth, and then to speak the truth and to defend the truth. Because this quality, this quality of being uh, these scholars, they described Ahmad bin Nasr as قوالا بالحق. This is how they described him. 
someone who speaks manifestly with the truth. This quality of speaking with the truth today, we have lost this quality of speaking with the truth. We mean specifically those cowards and those deserters who desert the people of the Sunnah and who compromise with the Jama'at and the people of Hizbiyyah and they dare not to speak a word of truth. Why? Because they fear the loss of status. They fear the loss of friendship. They fear the followers. So they won't speak against Hassan al-Banna. They won't speak against Sayyid Qutb. They won't speak against Abdurrahman Abdul Khaliq. They won't speak against those present in our time from the Hizbiyin and from those whom the ulama have warned against like Al-Ma'rbi and Halabi and Al-Maghrawi. They won't speak against the organizations and the Jama'at and the Marakis who affiliate themselves with those groups and parties. This attribute and this quality of being Qawwalan bil haq, we see that this is absent and it's not found. It's, in fact, it's found with the people who make an outward attachment to Salafiyyah in ilm only, in knowledge only. But as for the amal, it is not to be, is not to be found. So therefore they fall into something or a share of what Allah mentioned about those who are al-maghdubi alayhim. Those who know the truth, but they do not speak the truth. They do not speak the truth. This quality of speaking, of being qawwalan bil haq, is a quality that we have to nurture ourselves upon and follow the example of the ulama in our time and those who came before, likes of Sheikh al-Albani, Sheikh ibn Baz, do not believe the lie of these people who say that the manhaj of Sheikh al-Albani is other than the manhaj of Sheikh Rabi. Because when you look at Sheikh al-Albani and you see that he actually made tabdi of certain people, he refuted certain people by name in his books and in his works and his writings. He described certain people, like by way of example, Abdullah Azam, he described him as a zalim because he spread a lie against him because he lied against him and he said that Sheikh al-Albani made takfir of Sayyid Qutb. Well, he never made takfir of Sayyid Qutb. And even though he used to speak well of him, that he used to come and attend my lessons, Sheikh Al-Bani spoke the truth and he said, this man is a zalim, he is a wrongdoer. So do not believe this lie, ya ikhwan, which is being spread, that the way of Sheikh Ibn Baz and the way of Sheikh Al-Bani is other than the way of Sheikh Muqbil and Sheikh Rabi. Because when you look, you see that these scholars, they actually made tabdi of people. They refuted people by name. They wrote letters, they wrote books, and they wrote and refuted jama'at, and they refuted individuals by name. And they made tabdir of individuals by name. So do not fall into any of this propaganda and these lazia ikhwan. So in summary, what lessons you can take from this lesson, uh, which we can summarize as, that if you want to be someone who wants to be on that path upon whom is Allah's favor, that path which is huda, which is deenul haq, which is the, the, the you know, the, 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 all those descriptions that we've seen, the sabil, the sirat, and all those things were upon which is Allah's favor, then you have to be upon the mizan of the sunnah and the way of the sahaba and the salaf, and you have to be someone who openly proclaims that truth. Someone who is qawwal, and you're not scared to stand for the truth and the people of truth, because this is one of the requirements of you being upon the truth, of standing and defending the people of the truth. And the exemplification of that was the example from Ahmed bin Nasr al khuzai which we should use as an example. And ya ikhwan, there's no one in this, in, in this day and age who's going to tie you by the hands and tie your head and drag you to the leader of the, of the jama'ah, of the hizb. No one's going to take you to Abdurrahman Abdul Khaliq where your head's going to be chopped off or to you know the, the, any of these hizb. No one's going to take you and drag you by the feet you don't have this, what was present in the time of Ma'moon and Al-Wafiq and those times. You don't have this. So how can you not, how can you not speak a word? Yeah, Ikhwan, this is a lesson for us. How do we see these, these deserters and liars, these treacherous people, whether it be at the level of Yasir Qadi, who we know is outside of the Salafiyyah from a long time, or whether it be those who claim to be Salafi, make attachment to Salafi, and they cannot utter a word of truth about a Jama'ah, or about a Khariji, or about a, about a Hizbi, or a Mumayya. They can't even utter a word. Ya Ikhwan, you know, consider the fact that we are not in the time of Ahmed bin Nasr. You're not going to be dragged and thrown in a dungeon with your hands tied, with a sword taken out. Ya Ikhwan, all of these proofs and evidence show to us that anyone who cannot speak a word of truth 
this person is a mumayyah, muhaddil, a deserter, abandoner, and really there is no value, there is no qima in the heart of this man for the truth. Because if there was value in, in of the, of, if, the, if there was value for the truth in the heart of this man, we would see that value being expressed by your tongue and in your actions. This is what we would see, because that's what we see from the Salaf, and that's what we see from this great Imam Ahmed bin Nasr al khuzai So the lesson really is for us to take a lesson from this great Imam in speaking the truth in times and situations where it's easy for us to speak the truth. It's easy for us to speak the truth, Ya Ikhwan. How can you not hold a position of truth and speak that position of truth? So this, Ya Ikhwan, is the lesson, main lesson that we want to take from all of this. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Yeah. What's the name of it? Yeah, Muhammad bin Yusuf al-Firyabi. Yeah. It's like when you have a, a, a guard, a guard, he's stationed in a specific place, right? So his responsibility is his specific place to make sure no one comes in and attacks from that, from that area. That's what it's meant. Right, you stand, yeah. So you as a soldier, you've been taught to stand. You stand right here, don't move. So you've got to, you've got to defend your patch. Yeah, that's what it's meant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's given the most obvious example that no one, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true, yeah. It's true. Huh? No, because, because, uh, as I, as I said, that it's all in accordance with your ability. So, if in your ability you're not able to express the truth, whatever, then you don't do so. But it's within your ability. Well, if you're not, if, yeah, if you're not able to express and clearly explain, obviously it doesn't apply to you. But it can be even in simple things like, for example, if someone's going to speak ill of Sheikh Al Albani or Sheikh Mbaz or Sheikh Salaf Fuzan or Sheikh Rabi, you have love and mahabba for that alim, then you speak. Yeah, don't speak about this alim, even to that level. Everyone. Every person has at least something with which he's able to say and speak something. You understand? Even even the jahil, jahil has love of the ulama, right? He loves the ulama. He will not accept criticism against the ulama, so he can do that. But it's all within his level and capability. Inshallah. I'm going I'm to broadcast my email now to everybody. I'll I'll give it to you. I'll give it. To you. you want to know?